Uh, well, today we are going to dive into God's Word. We're continuing our summer series, if you've been with us at all during June and July, called Summer in the Psalms. Summer in the Psalms. And a big announcement, don't miss this, um, next week will be the final week of Summer in the Psalms. And so in light of that, we're going to take everybody to the beach next week, okay? It's going to be awesome, yeah. Not really, okay? Some of you are like, really, really? We're first time here. Whoa, well, you're signing back up, okay? No, but it would have been high attendance Sunday, would it not? Okay, some of y'all, you're like, we're not coming next week. No, we're coming now next week, all right? Okay, no, just every time I look at that graphic, like I want to go to the beach somewhere, okay? Like Gulfport or Guatemala, I don't really care. Just let it send me to the beach. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, I man, here's where we've been. We've been walking through some of the big chapters in the book of Psalms. Why are we doing that? Because we believe ideas for truth, we, our hope is that the unchanging truth of Scripture would become everyday truth for your life, that it matters, like God's Word really, really does matter, and that it would impact the way that we live and follow Jesus. And so today, we're going to Psalm 103, okay? So open up your copy of Scripture, hard copy, digital copy, Psalm 103, first time all summer we reached triple digits, okay? The temperature did it weeks ago, okay? We're just now getting on board. Psalm 103 is where we're going to be today, and if you don't have a copy of Scripture, uh, if you're new to our gatherings, we put verses on the screen so that you'll follow along with where we're going to be. Now, throughout the summer, we've covered a lot of Psalms so far, and if you kind of caught it, there's different themes within Psalms. Like some of them are lament or confession. Some of them are praise or thanksgiving. Some of them are like reminding ourselves of the promises of God. Today, here's our theme for Psalm 103. It is strictly and purely a Psalm of thanksgiving and praise. That's where we're headed today. In fact, 22 verses in today's Psalm, we're going to read all of them at some point, there isn't one single request or ask of God in 22 verses. It's pretty good. So convicting question to start the day. You ready? When is the last time that you prayed and you didn't even ask God for a thing in your prayer? Yeah, you can say, ouch or amen. I had to think about that this week. Typically, right, our prayers, whether it's our personal prayer or corporately as we pray together, um, it, it starts with like, God will you, right, or it gets there. God will you help, all right, or God will you provide, or God will you protect, or God will you heal. Now listen, God invites us to pray those kind of prayers. He does. But also our prayers should be filled with praise and thanksgiving. And today, Psalm 103, 22 verses, just straight praise. Man, God, you are so good. And you're going to see that today. So here's how it starts. Let's dive into it. Psalm 103, verse 1. Here's what David writes. He says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Verse 2. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. David starts the psalm with the theme of the psalm, and he says, Praise the Lord. Or your translation, I'm reading from NIV, your translation may read, Bless the Lord. Now, let's kind of get a couple of verbiage things there clear. Um, God is infinitely greater than man. So there's no way that finite man can do something to bless God or give him something that he doesn't already have. So why does David use that word in some translations? Well, what he's saying is what does bless the Lord is when his people and his creation praises him. That blesses his heart that we would praise him. And so he says, praise the Lord. And then verse 1 says, praise the Lord. He says, my soul. So it's kind of like David, is he's writing this, he's doing this personal reflection, and he's looking at his, his attitude, his heart, his mind, and he's like, man, I'm, I'm not really praising God enough. And so he's kind of having this internal conversation where he's talking to himself. Some of y'all, you talk to yourselves. We know, we see it. You think nobody sees it, we see it. David's talking to himself, and he says, soul, we're going to praise the Lord more. We're going to praise the Lord. And so in light of that, he begins to do that all throughout Psalm 103. Soul, praise the Lord. Um, write down this statement. When praise leads the way, it changes the entire day. And I know it rhymes, but that helps you remember it. Okay? When praise leads the way, it changes the entire day. Some of you need to write that down. Then some of you need to practice it on Monday. Okay, that'd be great. Your spouse would really appreciate that. When praise starts, man, it changes the tempo of everything around us. We are a people who gravitate towards negativity. This is what leads the way, right? Many times in our thoughts, in our speech, in our news, in our social media, we, we gravitate towards that. But what David's going to challenge us with today is that if you are saved, if you're forgiven by God, if you've been redeemed by him, praise should be what comes out of you first. 
praise should lead the way. In fact, David commanded his inmost being to praise the Lord. And I love what he said in verse 2. It's about to mean so much for us. He said, and forget not all his benefits. How many of you have ever worked at a job that gave some kind of benefits before? Okay, um, awesome, cool. And so they sit down, they're like, hey, here's all of the things that, like, we're going to pay you a salary, but then on top of that, you're going to have this thing and this thing and this thing. And David begins today to just lay out the benefits plan of following and knowing God. Can I just say today, it doesn't matter where you've worked or where you may work or where you did work, there's no benefit plan of this earth that matches the benefit plan of God. No 401k, no health insurance package, no bonus incentives. If you sell this much, then you get no, no, none in the stratosphere of what God's going to say today. And so, in fact, here's what we're going to do today is I'm going to use Psalm 103, and I'm going to lay out 10 what I'm calling benefits of the believer. Okay, 10, there's going to be a lot, 10 benefits of the believer. And so my hope today, here's, here's my hope as we end today. So you can write down that 10 benefits of the believer. Here's where I hope that you end today. So I'm going to go ahead and give you my underlying motive for the next 25 minutes or so. You ready? It is that at the end of today that we would have read all 22 verses of Psalm 103. I would give you 10 benefits of the believer, and you would sit there at the end of today, and you would be just overwhelmed at the goodness of God. As I read it this week, and was just, man, identifying what Scripture was saying, I was just like, no way, God. Like, for me, no way. And so my hope is that, that if you're a follower of Jesus, you'd get there today. That the word of God would be that real to you that you go, like, he loves me like that. He, he offers that to me. And, and you know what it would cause you to do? That praise would lead the way. That you go, God, like, I don't, I don't even know how to say anything back to that other than just, man, thank you. That's, that's it. That's where we're headed today, okay? So, like, if you're not into that, then sorry, that's where we're headed. Um, for some of you today, maybe you might hear the benefits of God. And maybe today you check into this moment and maybe like you didn't really want to come to the gathering and engage with this moment, but you got drug here by mama, daddy, or if you wanted to date her, you had to come, or if you like him, you had to be, listen, and maybe you're going like, is, it, is this whole thing even worth it? Like, is this whole following Jesus thing, like, is it really worth it? My hope today is that I can just be a communicator today of the benefits of the plan of God and then let you make that decision of is it really worth following a God who would offer this to you, okay? And so then at the end today, man, that we would all just be at a place of response. We either praise him or say, I follow you. Now, I want to make one last clarification before I begin to give you the 10 benefits. These benefits today, listen to me, are not automatically for everyone. What do you mean? Well, I'm just saying that we live in a culture today, guys, okay, and we have labeled it the Bible Belt. We could argue whether that's really still true or not, where we can begin to think that because I was born in the South, or Mama went to church, or I've been to church a handful of times, or I can quote John 3.16, or one time we said the Lord's Prayer together as a team, listen to me, that all of a sudden I am a believer, and I'm just telling you today, that's, that's not what this benefit plan is for. God offers these promises for those who would choose to surrender their life, to lay down themselves, to go, God, I need you, and I live my life now for you. That's way different than saying, well, I believe in the big man upstairs. Are you with me? In fact, I don't even like to use the word believer a whole lot. I'd rather use the word Christ follower because we believe in a lot of different things. But I said benefits today, and so believer was another B, and I needed to put them together because that made it better at the top of your notes. All right? But today, are you tracking with me? Okay. This isn't automatically for everyone, but can I tell you the good news today? But it can be for everyone. And so today, may receive that wherever you may be in the journey. All right, y'all going to have to listen faster. Here we go. Psalm 103, verse 2. Let's dive into it. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Here's the first one. Write it down, screenshot it, however you're going to remember it. Benefit one, forgiveness of sins. And I don't think it's a coincidence that David listed this benefit first. You ever read David, David's story before? He messed up a lot, okay, a lot, a lot. And it, then it got publicly recorded in Scripture. So David knows firsthand the importance of having his sins 
forgiven. And can I just get us all on the same foundation today? The greatest issue that you and I face right now at this moment in the world, in society, the greatest issue that you and I face, that your marriage faces, that your kids face, that you'll have at school in two weeks, that it's at your workplace, that's in our city, that's in our government, that's in our world, the greatest issue, hands down, unmatched, is a sin issue. Now, it manifests itself in a number of ways that frustrate us and make the news. But it is rooted in a sin issue. And Scripture is really, really clear. What does sin do? Sin separates us from God's design for our life and from relationship with Him. It separates us. But what does Scripture say? What what is the first benefit? You just wrote it down. That He forgives all your sins. Which ones did David say? All of your sins. What about that thing back from high school? Because you don't know about that thing. Forgiven. Well, but no, what about that choice in college? In Christ, forgiven. No, what about when we first got married and we weren't really ready and I did that thing and we said the thing? In Christ, forgiven. He forgives all our sins. The great pastor Charles Spurgeon said it this way. Look at this quote on the screen. So good. He says, If so much as the very smallest iniquity, the smallest thought, in thought or word or act, if it were left unforgiven, we should be just as badly off, just as far from God, just as unfit for heaven, just as exposed to hell, as though the whole weight of our sins were yet upon us. Let us ponder this deeply. You ever said before, well, it was just a, it was just a little bit of sin. I'm just dealing with this just a little, little issue. Well, let me put it in youth pastor language. How much dog poop is too much dog poop in the muffin for you to eat? Okay? All sins. The benefit of the believer is that God comes in and he forgives all of it in Christ. Psalm 103, verse 4. Here we go. Who redeems your life. Excuse me. Let me pick up second benefit. I almost missed it. Benefit two is this, healing power. Healing power. The end of verse 2 What did the end of verse 2 says? Who heals all your diseases. David says God created us, and therefore he holds healing power over our bodies and over our souls. Now, I know where some of you already are as you write that down, but he didn't heal mama, or he didn't heal my grandparent, or he hasn't healed my kid. That's very real. And I wish that I could stand here today and had enough time or enough knowledge in my finite mind to explain why people who follow God or know God can still suffer from illness. But I don't have the time nor the depth of the wisdom that is needed to explain all of that. But you know what I can tell you confidently today? That while all earthly sickness may not be healed on earth, The scripture promises very clearly that for those who know and love and follow him, there is coming a day, a day better than today, where all sickness and all disease and all mourning and all tears will be healed and wiped away. Why? Because he holds all healing power. And man, are we grateful for doctors and growing medical wisdom that God has given us. Praise the Lord for that. But let me just set the record straight that every act of healing, whatever that may be, no matter how miraculous that may be on earth, do you know who's at the root of that? The creator and giver of life. That he holds all healing power. And so today, even in your sickness, maybe whatever's going on in your family, listen to me, you can cry out to him. He invites you to call out to him that he's a healer. Now back to Psalm 103, verse 4. Who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with love and compassion. Here's benefit three. He rescues your life. He rescues your life. Some of you may remember Psalm 40 from a few weeks ago. Some of you were at the beach, so you missed it. We were here under the palm trees. Psalm 40, David said this at the beginning of Psalm 40. He said, you, God, lifted me out of the pit of mud and mire. You remember that? God lifted David out of the mire and put him in the choir. Some of y'all didn't remember nothing else from that message, but that one line right there. He lifted him out of the mud and mire. And what did he say? He said, you set my feet on a rock. 
You, God, that's what he's saying. You, God, you rescued my life. And the truth that we all have to come on to grips with today is that every person born onto this earth is born what? Into the pit of sin and self. And there is no way to get out. We are like a sheep caught in the pit with no hope. How many of you guys have seen that viral video? The sheep in the pit, all right, and the shepherd's trying to get it out. Anybody seen that video? Y'all gonna leave me stranded like that, okay? Cool, three of you, all right? Rest of you, Google it, okay? It's worth the Google and the eight-second watch where the pit, the, the sheep is in like the little ditch and the shepherd gets them out and dude, like sheep pogos for about seven steps right back into the ditch. All right, if you've seen it, you know. If you haven't seen it, it's worth it. Why is it worth it? Oh, because that's who we are. That's who we are. And Scripture says today, but that's who our God is. He, he stepped into the pit. And in fact, he sent Jesus into the pit of humanity, like all this chaos, that God took on flesh to come to us, to give his life on a cross, so that he might do what? So that he might be resurrected out of the pit. Why? So that you and I could be redeemed from the pit. We couldn't get out, no way to climb out. We're probably going to run back to it. But that he said, no, I'll provide a way out. And as the exchange, that's not like just the warm, fuzzy message we roll out on Easter weekend. That's the eternity-altering truth and benefit of a believer. That he redeems your life from the pit. He can rescue you out. Benefit four, write it down. He crowns you with love and compassion. He crowns you with love and compassion. Now, some translations say he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. It's real close to the same. I want you to think about this. What other little G-God, or what other person for that matter, rescues you from the pit that you got yourself in at their own expense, and then they rescue you out, and then they crown you? Nobody does that, right? No, you annoyed me. I couldn't even, I had to go get you out of the pit. I'm not going to crown you, but scripture says that's who God is, that he crowns us. And we understand a crown is what? Is a symbol of royalty. Let me paint it to you this way. This is what Paul writes about those who are in Christ. New Testament, Ephesians 2, 4, you can see it on the screen. But because of his great love for us, for you, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in the pit, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace that you have been saved. And here's verse 6, catch it. And God did what? And he raised us up with Christ. And he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in all the coming ages and all the coming days that he would show the incomparable riches of his grace that are expressed to us in his kindness through Christ Jesus. What is it saying? He's saying that the sacrifice of Jesus and salvation through that, God saw you in the pit, he raised you out of the pit, and then he crowned you with love and compassion, with his steadfast love and mercy. And he takes us, if you will, from criminal to crowning us as his child. And I don't know what lies you've been listening to, or how the mental battle goes on in your head. But maybe today you need to hear from Psalm 103 that today in Christ, you carry great value. And he sees you. And he knows you. And that in him, he crowns you as a child of the eternal king and nothing of this earth can take that away. benefits of a believer that he crowns you with love and compassion after he rescues you from the pit go back to psalm 103 let's go verse 5 who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles verse 5 gives us benefit five write it down satisfies you with good things he satisfies you with good things now let's appropriately understand this verse, because it would be easy to maybe misappropriately understand this verse. Scripture isn't saying that God satisfies us by giving us pleasure and entertainment all the days of our life. Okay? That's not what he said. You might have another preacher who tells you that, and they're wrong. Okay? When we praise God, when we obey him, when we say, God, I surrender, I lay down, not just I believe, but like I believe and follow. When we do that, do you know part of what happens or what should happen if it's true? He begins to alter your desires. Like your metric for what's good changes. 
Let me make it make sense this way. Um, our greatest desire moves from, God, would you give me that brand new fishing boat? To, God, would you make me a man of integrity and honesty and purity? That impacts my marriage and my workplace. Um, our desire changes when we're in him from, um, God, would you give me a new man or a new relationship or a new outfit to, God, would you make me a woman who walks in holiness and carries the character of Christ to my family, to my kids, to my spouse, to my workplace, to my friends. Um, when you're in him, students, this is for you. God, not just would you give me the desire to be like the coolest, most known, most viral, most popular kid at school, but God, because I follow you and you're changing my desires, God, would you help my friends to know you? And would you use me in that? How, whatever that looks like, God, I'm here. You feel that shift? And good is a whole new metric. And Scripture says that God doesn't just satisfy your desires. Don't read verse 5 and miss it. God doesn't just satisfy your desires with what you want, but he gives you what you need most. Okay? When my son comes to me after two bowls of ice creams and then asks, can he eat a whole pack of gummy worms, to him, that's good. As his dad, that's a bellyache and an issue coming in about 20 minutes. That's not what's best for him. And so scripture says that God satisfies you with what's good and that your purposes align with him. End of verse 6, we just read it. He says, so that your youth is renewed like the, did you catch it? He's an animal, like the eagles. Here's the benefit, then let's talk about the eagle part. Benefit six, he renews your strength. He renews your strength. Now, why does he use the imagery of an eagle? The imagery of an eagle, if you catch it, it is our nation's bird. It's the symbol of strength and vitality and youthful endurance that some of us don't really still have anymore, okay? But that's why he uses that. The benefit of the believer, the follower of Jesus, is what? That God satisfies your life with the strength and the perseverance that you need. Now, many of us love to quote this verse. You've got it on a Bible cover, a t-shirt, or grandma's got it on a picture frame. Isaiah 40, verse 30. Look at it on the screen. It says, even you grow tired and weary. Y'all read this one before? This not if you're with me, okay? And young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord, here it is, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like, you say it, eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Here's what I know about some of you. You are tired and weary. You walk in, but you're faint. And you're overwhelmed and stressed out and you're anxious. I'm just trying to read you the word of God today that says the benefit of the believer is that God can renew your life. With what? With the strength and the endurance, with the peace and the patience that you need. What? If, if you will trust and seek him. Well, how does, how does that happen? How does he renew me? I, I can't reach out and grab that. Well, I think as we stand even in our gathering and we declare today how great is our God. Man, name, no name above your name. There's renewing power in our worship. As we engage scripture, like Julie talked about a while ago. Why does she do that? Because there's renewing power in the word of God. I don't always understand it. Man, but you keep going to it. And as I pray to him, I don't even always know what to pray. And a lot of times it is requests. It's not praise. But guess what? There's renewing power because it's aligning my faith with him. Are you following me? He, the benefit is you can come to him and he goes, oh, I know where you are weak. And I'll renew you. Verse 6, keep reading Psalm 103. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all of the oppressed. And he made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. He's talking Old Testament here. He says, the Lord, verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and he is gracious and he's slow to anger and he is abounding in love. Here's benefit seven. It's good. He is gracious and he's slow to anger. He is gracious and he's slow to anger. Now in verse 6, David describes the justice of God, right? When people are oppressed. Hear me today. God addresses God comes to the needs of the weak and the forgotten that's who he is and then he further illustrates that in verse 8 with our words he's compassionate he's gracious and he's slow to anger with his children 
Anybody have small children at your house? Have you ever had small kids at your house? Okay. They come with like this built-in wiring. I don't even understand it, but like they come out of the box with this built-in wiring to know how to press the frustration anger button, right? Agitated button of the parents or anyone who chooses to care for them, right? Your house too? Okay, I didn't make sure it wasn't just my house, all right? Like for the 97th time, would you not put your macaroni up your nose? Like it's not where <laughs> it goes. And I don't know about you, but man, in my parenting flesh, woo, underneath the surface, it can just start like that. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Now I'm talking real. Some of y'all done woke up. And you may keep it down here, or it may just show right here, or it may come out right here. All right? But man, it just presses that button inside of us. And the beauty of Scripture today is, says, that's not the character of our God towards his kids. He's compassionate, and he's gracious, and he's slow to anger, and he's abounding in love. You know, our default as a society with other people, when they do us wrong, and ooh, they do us wrong, right? They said that thing. They posted that deal. They stabbed me in the back. They talk about me and didn't even say nothing. Listen to me. Our response is what? I will make you pay until I feel it's enough. I will harbor that anger or that bitterness as long as I can, until I feel justified in that. And as I read that this week, man, I just thought, oh, it's a really good thing we're not God. Because the character of God is what? Well, Scripture says he's compassionate and he's gracious and he's abounding in love. And maybe for somebody today, I don't know, it may just be one person, but maybe you've lived a lot of life believing that God just, he just exists with like this low level of frustration towards you. You ever going to get it together? Why do you keep falling in the same areas? And that's who you believe the character of God is. And I think Psalms today is maybe, it's just shaping your mind. Man, it's just flipping our idea of who, who really is our God. Man, at his, at his core, his heart is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love. Now hear me. He has a clear standard of holiness, and it matters. And he's exercised punishment against that over and over in Scripture. But you know what I believe it's come after? A long, slow period of grace and compassion and abounding in love. And that's who he is. He's gracious and he's slow to anger. Pick up verse 9. We've got three more to go. Psalm 103, verse 9. He will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Benefit eight, write it down. Unmeasurable mercy. Unmeasurable mercy. This one's good. I've heard the difference. I've described it this way. I didn't come up with it, but I've heard the difference in grace and mercy taught this way. You probably heard it. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And I love it. Verse 10, what did he say? David says, God does not treat us as our sins deserve. Can I tell you what our sins deserve according to the scripture? The greatest wrath and punishment that God could offer. That's what we deserve. That's what we drew up. But Scripture says that's not what he offered. That's not how he addressed us. And I love this. In verse 11 and 12, it attempted, David's trying to like describe, he's like, well, if I was to lay out the yardstick, how would I measure the love of God? How would I measure the mercy of God? He's, he's trying to quantify it, right? We, we like numbers. And in verse 12, he uses the metric. He's like, I know what we'll use. We'll use east to west. And he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Watch this. Heard this this week as I was studying. They said, we have no idea if David knew the shape of the earth when he wrote this. I don't know if you knew, but there's a little debate over that for a little while. Was it flat or was it round, right? Remember that? Okay. And our boy David, we don't know if he knew it was a sphere when he wrote east to west. But you know who did know? The Holy Spirit who prompted him to write those words. 
and to use that metric. So because, David, you will know, and all, all people need to know, that the mercy, the unmeasurable mercy of God, it goes east to west. And if you're measuring east to west on a sphere, it doesn't end. It says the mercy of God, it is unmatched. It is infinity in degree and distance. And I don't know about you, but man, when I just sit on that for about seven seconds, man, just praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord that, that my sin, the things in my life, cannot outdistance the unmeasurable mercy of God. Benefit, unmeasurable mercy. Verse 13, pick back up. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we're formed, and he remembers that we are dust. Benefit nine, the compassion of a caring father. The compassion of a caring father. And I realize as you write that down or you hear me say that, you go, well, I don't know that compassion is always the first response of an earthly father. Not always at my house either. But David says it is the first response of God as a perfect heavenly father. David says God has compassion on those who do what? There was a little condition there at the end. Did you catch that? On those who fear him. What is he talking about? What kind of fears is he talking about? Well, he's not talking about a fear that causes us to run from God trembling, but rather a fear that causes us to run to God in reverence. Well, that sounds scary. Well, I think once you realize that his love for you is north to south and his mercy for you is east to west, man, it should just cause you to go, that's a good dad. And you would run to him and hop up in his lap like a little boy does with his father to find that to be a place of protection, a place of rest, where daddy's in charge. And some of you, maybe you've lived for a long time, maybe you rolled into this moment today, and you've lived thinking and fearing God's wrath and God's punishment. And today, he just reminds you, man, in Christ, under the covering of Jesus and his righteousness, God is a compassionate and he's a caring father. And that's who he can be in your life. Verse 15, Psalm 103, The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower on the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place is not even remembered anymore. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. There it is again. And his righteousness with their children's children. Verse 18, it's with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Here's number 10. Write it down, then let's break it down. Benefit 10 is eternal and unconditional love. Eternal and unconditional love. Now, I hate to be morbid, But unless the Lord comes back, we're all going back in the box. Just like with Monopoly. When somebody's bought all the properties and taken all your paper money, it all goes back in the box. And David realized, he was still enough to realize, man, this life is like a vapor. It's like a drip of water on a Mississippi sidewalk in July. It ain't going to be there very long. In fact, he compared it to a flower. Did you catch that? He's like, man, it's like a little flower that's about yay big in the field. And then like a 22-mile-an-hour gust just, and it blows away, and it's not even there anymore. They don't even remember where it was. Can I just tell you today, like, I know we cling to this life with everything we got, and for some of us, it feels like we're here for forever or we got so long left. And I'm, I'm just, I have to wrestle with it. I'm just telling you what the word says. Man, it, it is but a vapor. Well, that doesn't sound like good news. Well, it depends on how you receive it, but can I give you the good news of the benefit in it? Even in our very temporary state, you know what it, scripture says? The Lord's love spans what? From everlasting to everlasting. It has no boundaries has no timeline, has no end. 
One commentator that I read this week, he says, God's love does not alter with our altering or change with our changes. And man, this life can seem to move faster and faster the older we get. Had that conversation with somebody this week. Man, sometimes it changes by the year, and for some of us, we feel it changing by the day. And while there's so much that is temporary and unstable in this life, there is one thing that you can bank on that will last and it won't change from creation into eternity and that's the unconditional eternal love of God and David says in verse 19 I love it he he makes reference to he says all throughout history if you've read it studied it looked at it there's kings and there have been rulers and there have been nations and there have been civilizations and they all have one thing in common you know what the one thing is they didn't last (laughs) They all went away. They're at the top of the hill on one day, and they all went away. But the one thing that has not changed, that will not change, that will never end, is the everlasting to everlasting, eternal, unconditional love of God. And he has that love for you. So is it worth it? I mean, what, what are really the benefits of knowing God? Does it matter? Well, David says, for those who know and follow God, here they are. Forgiveness of sins, healing power. He rescues your life. He crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies you with his good things. He renews your life. He's gracious and he's slow to anger. He's unmeasured in his mercy. He has the compassion of a caring father, and he offers eternal and unconditional love. It's like I can just kind of picture David, and I don't know, he's on his back porch, whatever that meant for him. And he's just writing this. And this is where it lands him. As he writes all these benefits, this is where it lands him. This is the end of the chapter. Psalm 103, verse 20. You ready? He says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, you angels, you as angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, like you who obey his word, just praise the Lord. Like all the, all the heavenly hosts, like you, his servants, who do his will, who follow him, who know him, praise the Lord. And then he says in verse 22, all his works everywhere in his dominion, everything that's been created, praise the Lord and me too. My soul. Praise the Lord. All right, where, did, where did David begin Psalm 103? You remember? Verse 1 and 2. He says, all all my inmost being, my soul, praise the Lord. And it's as if he's sitting there and he's writing out benefit after benefit, the mercy and the compassion and the love and the grace and the unchanging nature of our God. And he goes, you know what? My song's not enough. My little mediocre solo, I'm singing over on the edge of the stage. It's not enough. And there needs to be just like this eruption of a chorus that's never ending from everything that's ever been created praise to the Lord. Don't ask him for anything. Just praise him. Angels, your turn. You're in. Created things, you're in. Everyone, everywhere, the church, everybody in. Praise the Lord. Praise him. Don't stop it. Sing it again. Praise the Lord. So I just wondered today, that's David. Like, what about you? Because we all have to do something with it. What about you? Like, are you, can you confidently say today, are you living life in light of the benefits of a believer? Because for some of you today, maybe you rolled into this moment, you're going like, is it even worth it? And my hope today is that you heard the character of God, the love of God to rescue you and pursue you and forgive you and crown you and love you. And now you've got to figure out what you're going to do with that. But for a lot of you who would go, man, I know him. He did rescue me. He does love me. He has forgiven me. He pours out mercy on my life. What are you going to do with it? Told you where I hope that we landed. That it lands you in a place to go, man, how can I not live my life for him? How can I not fully follow him 
And how can I not allow everything that's in me, my inmost being and everything that I am, to praise him? No matter where you may be in life or in your faith journey, we pray today's time pointed your heart to what is true and gave you hope to hold on to. We want you to know that we are available and ready to pray for and encourage you as you learn what it means to get life in Jesus and give life to others as you live out your faith. To get a conversation started with one of our ministry team members, you can send us a private message or text your first name to 601-397-6111. We would love to pray for you and walk you through anything that you may be experiencing. You can find reading plans and other resources to help you take the next step in your faith on our website, www.theexchange.cc. As we close out our time today and prepare to scatter as a church, let us speak out our declaration together. We believe the great exchange took place when Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us so we could know God. We exist to see people exchange their old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. Christ's love compels us to exchange ideas for truth. God's word is our standard. Selfishness for serving, we will serve others. Pleasing for reaching, we will share our faith. Keeping for dispersing, we will make disciples. Forgetting for celebrating, we will praise God. We are the church.